All right, so we're going to get started. As you guys you know, feel free to come up here and grab your lunch and drinks. Um, Kirksville, hello. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. This is recording, so you all will be able to view the recording afterward if you need to. Um, just a few administrative things, housekeeping things, I guess they call it. Um, Dr. Roy wanted me to mention to use the mics while asking questions. So if you have a question, I'll bring the mic over and you can ask it through the mics so everyone can hear. Um, if you have a question, if you could send it to me through the Zoom chat, I can see it there first and um, answer the question. Hopefully answer it. Attempt to answer the question, shall I say. Um, and then yes, the, for the presentation will be recorded. So I think that's it. So I think we'll just get started then. I'm going to turn this down. I should see a notification if there's a, a chat here. So I'll open that up when I see it. Um, and then I'm going to hide this, these videos here of other people. So I won't be able to see Kirksville, everyone else is on the, on the Zoom meeting. Okay, so hello, everyone. Um, I want to say thank you to the SRI, Dr. Roy, Jessica Corrick, Dr. Dagenhart for inviting me to give this talk and thank you all of you for coming and, and listening. It's a pleasure to be here. So I have to do this. Um, so if you don't know me, uh, my name is Vanessa Pazernick. I'm the senior statistician in the Department of Research Support. I have been working at ATSU for a little over eight years now. In the last two and a half years, I've been living in Washington State. So Kennewick is the big star. That's where I live. Uh, so I'm kind of surrounded by Seattle, Portland, Spokane, and Boise. Still have yet to kind of do my traveling. I'd love to visit Seattle. So if you ever plan a trip to Seattle, you can take a hike over to Kennewick and come visit. So my talk is, my outline for my talk is pretty straightforward. After a short introduction, I'll talk about all the different activities that kind of make up the majority of preparing data for analysis. Uh, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. You can think of other ways, other activities you can do to prepare for data. Um, but I have here kind of the main five I see commonly. So I have structuring data sets properly, what is coin tidy data. Um, I'll get into that a little bit. Handling missing values, correcting spelling errors, uh, correct, uh, sorry, outlier checking and date parsing. And then I'll end with a kind of conclusion slide there. Yeah. So just as an introduction, preparing data is not just a first step, but must be repeated over the course of the study. As you collect new data, new problems will arise. You'll have to be constantly monitoring that, um, checking for any inconsistencies that you didn't anticipate and trying to correct that. Uh, when you finally do transfer the data over to an analyst, if you are using an analysis, an analysis uh, the process that that person will use to clean the data should just be a culmination of all the steps you took to prepare the data up to that point. Um, and even after the data, the statistician or data anal analyst cleans the data, gets it into that clean data, when she starts to begin or he starts to begin the analysis, there may come up other things that they didn't realize before and will have to go back and clean some more. So it really is an ongoing process that starts at the beginning and doesn't really end until you're finally done with the analysis. The end goal here is just to have clean data. And I'm defining clean data as a data set where you're reasonably certain that everything in there is correct. So here we have the research study life cycle. Um, this is research supports depiction of it. So we have it divided into five main phases. We have study development, study initiation, data collection and management. It's kind of a circular cycle of collecting data. Then database closure and data analysis, and then publication and study close out. And so I've circled all of the key descriptions where there seems to be active data going on. So you can see in study development, that's where we create a data management plan. We want to make sure we know what data we're collecting, where we're going to store it, how we're going to code things. Um, then we go into data collection and management. That's where we have this ongoing process of collecting data, monitoring the data that comes in, making sure it's what we thought we were going to collect. There's no inaccuracies there. 
Um, and then going into database closure analysis, that's where we start to um, really process and clean the data. We transfer it over to the statistician. She does a lot of, he or she does a lot of work um, to, to prepare it for the analysis. And again, that should be a point where it's like a culmination of the steps that led up to that point. Um, and then finally, that's kind of the end. It, during the data analysis process, they may actually come up with more questions to have resolved. So 80% of data analysis spent on the process of cleaning and preparing the data. This may not come as a shock to some of the statisticians in the audience, but it may come as kind of a shocking statistic for other people who may envision, you know, a statistician, she just takes the data and does a few point and clicks on the computer and we're done. Uh, that's, not, that's not the case. So, um, of course, this 80%, that statistic may vary depending on what uh, the data is. It may be more complex and require more time. Some data sets are fairly straightforward. Um, but any da good data analyst will still spend some time trying to summarize the data, um, visualizing the data to make sure that clean data set that they're given actually is clean. So you still spend some time. So this issue of irreproducible data has recently gained some attention um, with the increasing costs of study development for drugs, um, also along with the uh, recent failures in late stage clinical trials, and as well as this more demand for better therapies. Um, so this is kind of a list of some of the um, attention that I've seen just in preparing this talk. So this first one came from a study out of California from a biotech company, where they wanted to look at, they, they took a list of 53 of the landmark cancer research studies, and they wanted to see if they could repeat the findings for reproducible research. And the, the sad fact is they were only able to find reproducible research. They were only able to confirm the findings in just 11% of those studies. Um, there's another, in 2016, the ASA, the American Statistical Association, issued its first ever statement on p-values to stem their misuse and misinterpretation. That if you haven't read the statement, it's fairly short, but the gist of it is, is you know, p-values, they have their value, but they also have their limitations. And you want to make sure you're reporting your p-values along with other you know, statistical analysis findings, such as your estimates and your confidence intervals with that. That should be emphasized just as much, if not more, than the p-values themselves. Um, and then in 2018, Nature, there was a Nature special on reproducibility. Uh, one of the key reads in that special said basically, um, you know, researchers, they need to be able to convey the, the research that they did so that other researchers can reproduce it. So the definition of reproducible research is that the research can be repeated by other researchers and have the same results. That's ultimately what we want. Um, this last item there, uh, Nature Guidelines, that's a journal um, that has author guidelines that allow for authors to include raw data and code. So it's even easier to have that reproducible research where other researchers can look at your raw data and your code. So then we get into why clean data? One, it facilitates the initial exploration and analysis. I could really replace the word facilitates with a prerequisite for. It's absolutely essential to do the analysis to have this. Um, two, it improves ability to collaborate with others. Um, as I said, you want to spend more time doing the actual statistical analysis rather than the data cleaning. Um, so the better that imbalance is in favor of the statistical analysis, the better everyone is off. Um, at Johns Hopkins, there's a data science lab group who say that the number one source of the speed of variation to results is the status of the data. So if you can get the status of the data in good shape from statisticians, the results can be turned around much quicker. Much quicker. And this third bullet helps to achieve reproducible research. If you are doing a good, diligent job of cleaning your data, making sure it's accurate, um, you'll be able to have, they'll be able to help this problem of reproducible research. Um, if you also, you know, have your if you're running R scripts or some computer program, you also have that exact recipe for how you got from raw data to the clean data. So that anyone can look at that code and see exactly how you manipulated the data to your final data set. So um, for this talk, when I first got asked to give this talk, preparing data for analysis, that's a pretty broad topic. And you could really go a lot of different directions for that. So 
Um, I'm not going to be really spending a whole lot of time on the technical details of how you prepare data for analysis, but it will be more on the big picture of, of what it is and, and why we need to do it. So it, it's not geared toward any one specific software program like Excel or R. I know my audience is probably varies quite a bit in, in terms of what programming languages they're most familiar with. So I'm not going to get too into that. And so I say that then pull up this, this paper by uh, Hadley Wickham. Hadley Wickham is a chief scientist at R Studio. He's well known um, by R users for his many contributions to the R language package. But he wrote this paper uh, titled Tidy Data. And he coined this term Tidy Data in 2014 to, con it, to convey the proper structure of your data sets. What is the best structure for your data set? So I'm going to be taking a lot of the material from his paper and, and, and presenting it here on the proper structure of data set. Um, I will also note that even though he is an R user, again, this paper is really accessible to anybody, whether you use R or not. Um, so if you think of a data set, it generally you can break it down really simply into three uh, elements. Um, if you think of an Excel file, you have your variables along the columns, and then you have your observations in the row. And then at that intersection of row and column, you have your values. So <clears throat> variables measure some underlying attribute, for example, height, duration, frequency, et cetera. Observations are the collection of all measurements for variables related to that single entity. And then variables reside at that intersection, variables and observations. So every value in your data set will be associated with one variable and one observation. I need some water. Okay, so a little audience participation, perhaps. <laughs> um, so this is a very simple data structure. So we have female, male, pregnant, non-pregnant, and in the body of the table, we have the count. So this data set has three variables. Uh, does anyone want to take a guess on what they are? Or I'll just let you think about it for a few seconds, and I'll tell you. Six variables, okay. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for being brave and guessing. Anyone else have a guess? Yeah. Huh? Count is one, yes. Count is one variable. Can anyone name the other two variables? Yes, thank you. Kurt Bay, of course, everyone. <laughs> so yes, this data set has three variables. Female, male, male's not a variable. It's sex is the variable. Pregnant isn't a variable. It's the pregnancy status is the variable. So if we read, uh, arrange our table like this, it may be more easy to see what the answer is to that question. So we see we have three variables, sex, pregnant, pregnancy status, um, and frequency, or count. You could call it whatever you like. Then we have the observations. We have four observations and a total of 12 values. So that's basically our, our proper data set structure as an example. Um, so here are the principles that are kind of outlined in that paper I showed you before um, that make up a, a tidy data set. Um, so we have number one, each variable forms a column. Number two, observations, each observation forms a row. I put three and four kind of a little grayed out. They're kind of optional. Um, they're not pertinent to a data analysis to have logical ordering, but in general, you want to scan the raw data. It's easier to see if it's in a logical ordering. So generally what that means is the first variable is ordered and then followed by the second variable and so on. Um, number four, short descriptive column names in the row, that's always helpful as well. Not having a long, a long list for names, you know, no spaces, things like that. Um, so these are the characteristics of tidy data sets. So what's the opposite of tidy? Messy, messy data set. And so a messy data set is anything that does not Got it, there's these principles. So Hadley Wickham had a, had a good retoiling of this popular quote from Leo Tolstoy. So like families, tidy data are all alike. Every messy data set is messy in its own way. So that's what makes data cleaning so much fun. <laughs> so I'll just go over a few quick examples. It looks like we're doing pretty good on time. 
three common problems with messy data sets. I'll give you three examples and we can go through them. So the first one is column headers are values and not variable names. So in this example, we have a table from uh, a report by the Pew Research Center, and they were looking at the relationship between religion and income in the US. So the problem with this data set, in terms of preparing it for data analysis, is that we have values in the column headings and not variables, okay? But just to note, in a report, this, this way of structuring your data is a very efficient way to convey the information. So there, there are different um, data structures for different purposes. But for our purpose, when we're trying to do analysis, we want to have this as tidy data. So, so again, three variables here. We have religion, income, and then we have the count. So we just want to transform it just like we did the, the, the sex, pregnancy, and the count for the earlier example. So what does that look like? When we put it in a tidy data set, we have religion, income, and then frequency. So you can see for that first cell, agnostic, less than 10K, 27 count. That's the first observation you see in the tidy data set. Um, it is cut off in the original table from 50 to 75, but it does extend a little bit further. You can see that in the tidy data set. All right. The second example of a messy data set, um, multiple variables in one column. So this is interesting. Um, this is, in this example, these are tuberculosis counts across different countries and year across demographic groups. And so this is a little bit more complex than the last one because you can see in the columns, they're actually combining two different variables. Can anybody guess what the two variables are there that they're combining? So we, I'm talking about this M014 and these M1524. Any guesses? Yeah, so sex and age. So we want to split that up and put them in two different, two separate variables and then put the counts in there in its own variable. Okay. So we, after we do that, uh, this is what we get. So we got country, year, sex, age, and the number of cases. Okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's, this, all of this really just facilitates the analysis because sometimes we want to look at, you know, rates across just males or rates across just females. This really facilitates uh, being able to do that. Uh, the last example I'm going to show you is the variables in both rows and columns. This is a pretty um, interesting one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would probably wonder what they were thinking in terms of how they organize this. So, this is um, weather data from a weather station in Mexico. Uh, so we have the ID for the weather station, uh, year, month. This element, it's not really a variable, it's just a container for variable means. So we have, in the rows, we have this temperature max is one variable and temperature min is our second variable. You see it in the, in the rows. And then across the columns, we have D1, D2, D3. Those are the days, so we have you know, you could line it up. You see that first cell that has a number in it for um, the month is two, year is 2010, PMAX is uh, 27.3 for D2. That's corresponding to February 2nd, 2010, where the te maximum temperature was 27.3. So, yeah, not so good. Um, so, what we want to do here is, you know, put the day as its own column in the, in the data set, as its own variable, and then put the maximum min as uh, column, column headers as well. So they're their own variable. So that's what it looks like. Ah, much better. So, uh, this first observation, the first row in the tidy data set, that corresponds to January 30th, which we don't see in this original table. Uh, but the second observation, that corresponds to February 2nd. So we see that corresponding 27.3 for the max and 14.4 for the min is, is shown here in that second observation. Okay, uh, and one last thought on data set structure. If you are trying to do this and you're kind of wondering if it should be this way or this way or that way, you know, you don't really know which way it should go, um, 
it should really be driven ultimately by what analysis you're going to be doing. So these two data sets, you can get the same result, but the one on the left is structured for a paired t-test, and the one on the right is structured for a mixed effects model. So just keep that in mind if you're kind of confused and not really sure what to do. Talk to a statistician, you can do that of course, um, but ultimately it's going to be driven by what analysis you're going to be doing. All right, that's it for tidy, tidying data. <laughs> my, last, my next uh, activity for preparing data for analysis is handling missing values. So Dilbert is my husband's like favorite cartoon. And he informed me that Dilbert always has three panels, which I learned when I was preparing for this talk. So this one's a complete Dilbert. You'll see in a, another slide I have an incomplete Dilbert. So look forward to that. <laughs> um, so handling missing values. So of course Dilbert is making those values. So we don't want to do that, obviously. So what do we do when we have missing values? Um, well, when it, we're in the context of preparing data for analysis, um, we want to make sure when we're doing this in the study planning period to make sure we have a plan, trying to anticipate where missing data could occur. Um, for example, age, we want to make sure, one thing we could do is make sure we have a plan for coding for missing, either put an NA or have some other code like a string of things to indicate that this value is missing. Uh, if you um, want to indicate some valid values for age, you can do that as well. You can say from zero to 120, uh, that's gonna be a valid value that we're gonna say is for age. We can also anticipate if somebody, doesn't, somebody may not give their age, we could give other options like they refuse the answer. And then we would know why that value is missing. So sometimes knowing why a value is missing uh, can be really relevant when it comes to data analysis. So preparing the data so that you have that information uh, can be really critical in the end. Um, do you anything else I want to say about that? Oh, um, yes. So uh, sometimes I get people who, like for example, race is pretty common where they don't have the data for race, but the student may have collected the data and they say, I, I'm pretty sure this guy is Caucasian. Can I just put Caucasian in there? Um, so to that, I, I, <laughs> I usually say, okay, well, if you're, it depends on how certain you are, but even then, you know, it's not coming from the, from the actual source. So we, we're not 100% sure. So in that, case is, in that case, you know, it depends, but um, you could have another column that says, uh, guess, yes or no. And then you could put no for all the ones that you actually got the data on, and then a yes for the ones that correspond to where the student had to guess. And then we can take care of that, figure out the best way to analyze that data. When, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. So Kurt, Kurt Bay said his answer to that question is, it, it depends on whether the student feels comfortable writing that up in the method section is, is how he would answer that question. Yeah, would, would the journal editor be okay with you know, that method, that decision? So again, something you need to write in the methods you know, for reproducible research. Like, again, you need to make sure all the decisions you made from raw data to clean data are explicitly listed out. You know, other researchers may not agree with that. They have okay. Um, the next thing is correcting spelling errors. Um, so hand entering data in the field is a common source of spelling errors. It can be a real headache when you get all this data and it's the, the values are different because of spelling, but they really should all be treated the same. So that's the biggest one that comes to me where I'm like pushing it back on the person who gave me the data. Like you need to fix this and then bring it back. I can't deal with that. <laughs> so um, when you're thinking about um, data that you know, would require a lot of, perhaps induce a little bit of a spelling error issue at the end, um, reducing, reducing that by eliminating free-form text fields um, is always a good idea. So for example, race, if you have all the categories that you anticipate um, would be filled out beforehand and the person can just select it rather than having to write it in. Uh, that's always a good idea. Uh, and of course, you can always have this other option and then, um, you know, branching logic that allows them to have an open text to explain what they meant by other. Um, I will say that, you know, freeform text fields, they do have their place as well. There's a lot of qualitative researchers out there who use freeform text and, and machine learning these days. It's just getting better and better. It's really exciting what we can do now with freeform text. So, um, not to say that it's completely evil. Uh, there is some purpose for free text as well. Um, this is just an example. 
of 52 different entries for the same restaurant. It, they're all McDonald's, but they're all spelled differently. So they're all being recognized as a different, uh, a unique entry. So again, this is just kind of a headache. You have to manually scroll through all that list and make sure that they're all really, you know, the one you think it is. So that's again, where I kind of push it back on the person who collected the data to fix it. Um, okay, so um, outlier checking, that's the fourth thing I'm going to talk about, the fourth activity. Um, so outlier checking, outliers are really difficult to define. It, there's no really good definition of it. So you're kind of vague when you're defining outliers, um, but they're basically data points distant from the norm. Um, they may indicate an error in the data set, but they also may be correct values that are true outliers. So you really have to be careful when you're dealing with outliers and whether you can include them or not include them, you know, really figuring out if they are accurate, if they're true or not is important. So here's the second bill work. <laughs> so I'm often the person on the left, are you sure the data you gave me is correct? And then I have never heard this response yet, so I'm not trying to give any ideas out there, but Please, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so outlier checking, it usually involves um, some data visualization. That's usually the easiest to go about it. Um, so here, scatter plots, clearly see the outlier. You could probably be reasonably sure that this is not accurate. Um, histograms are also great. Um, you can clearly see for this one age, we have a guy girl who's over 150, that's got to be something we need to check out. Probably not true. Um, and then also somebody, somebody who's very young so that can really stick out. Okay, and then finally, the third one, I'm just going through kind of the main plots that you can do for checking out liars, box plots are also very common. Um, so I have a quick story to tell about outliers that's kind of fun. And the person who told me this is in Kirksville, so she can tell me later if I said it right or not. But um, she was involved in a study where she was, um, one of the data variables was like waist circumference. So they were measuring the waist with, you know, standard tape measure. And then she noticed when she got the data back that there were these group of observations that were just really large compared to the rest of the group. Um, so she did a little bit of digging and found out that they all occurred on one day by one nurse. And when she, talked to the nurse, they found out that she was actually measuring the circumference from the wrong end of the tape measure. So, so that was a really easy fix. So, you know, you were able to get the correct data just by subtracting the, the length of the tape measure from the raw value. So she was able to rectify it and all was good again. So, you know, a fun story, the true story. So, um, one last thing about outliers is you'll commonly see um, these flag variables, different variants of that, like strings of zeros, strings of nines, strings of ones, sometimes variants of the above with negative values. Um, so if you're checking for outliers and you see something like this as an outlier, you may have to go back and figure out, okay, what does, does that mean actually sometimes? Um, so just one example of that is when you're looking at Qualtrics data, um, one of the advanced options when you're exporting the data, as you can see here, this recode, but, recode scene, but unanswered questions is negative 99. So that can be um, useful when you're doing the analysis if you see missing values from people who saw the question and didn't answer versus people who um, didn't answer because they didn't even see the question. Uh, this is really quick. So date parsing, when you're dealing with dates in analysis, it can be pretty complicated. Um, and, and so the only thing I really want to say here is um, just that they're hard. Uh, date, dates and times are hard. Um, text data varies in structure, so you can have really inconsistent ways that people, you know, record dates. You know, in, in the U.S., we commonly do month, day, year. Everywhere else, it seems to be day, month, year. So you have to make sure you're looking at the date, you're interpreting the date the correct way. Um, then you have leap years. There's even leap seconds, which I didn't know about before this talk. There's sometimes minutes have 61 seconds. So whatever. Um, you have different time zones and daylight saving times, they all affect um, trying to do math with data. So it can be pretty complicated. Luckily, if you, if you use R, they have some good packages. Um, there's also, there's Lubridate package that's by, contributed by Hadley Wickham again. Um, the Posit CT object is also in base R, it's really helpful. 
Um, so that's very specific to our users. Um, if you're doing it in Excel or something else, just be sure that um, any calculations you're doing with Excel, you really understand uh, what they're doing. Um, this code on the right, this is just an example of um, some R code where it can take um, different, different ways of interpreting data and really make sure it's coming up as you would expect. So that's really, um, really great for dates. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about date posting. Um, so that's the end of all the different activities. Like I said, it's not an exhaustive list. There are certainly other ways you can, other activities you can do in data preparation for analysis that I didn't mention here. Um, but I just wanted to mention quick, on our portal site under the FAQ tab, um, we have this section, is there a recommended format for submitting data for biostatistician consultation? Yes, there is. Um, so these are kind of the guidelines. Um, include the raw data, that's always helpful for us. To construct a tidy data set, so again, what that is, each variable in one column, each row is an observation, first row contains short, clear, no space column names, and then quote for missing data, and if you have it, reason for the missingness. Um, you may have heard me mention code book um, in this talk. So what that is, that's basically just a file, it can be a Word document Excel, um, that describes each of the variables in a little bit more detail than in your data. So showing what the variable name you use in the description, and then if you have it, the units of that variable um, can be really helpful when you know you hand it over to the an analysis an analyst. Um, if you have any summary choices that you made, you know include those. And if you do have that information on your experimental design, can be helpful. Um, so I have just a quick example of a code book. Um, most of most people in this room and in, in the audience are probably familiar with a code book, but it just basically Again, includes information about variables, summary choices, and experimental design. So on the right here, you see screener initials. That's one of the variables in the data. And you can see KJ. That means Tim J. You know, school code region. That's, that's basically what it looks like. Um, if you use Qualtrics or Redcap, they automatically come with the data dictionary. So that's that's pretty nice. Um, study design. You know, have a short blurb of that. That just helps with what the analysis. Analyst needs, you don't have to read that, but it's just, it, it's helpful for the analysts when they get the data and know how it was collected, and what they need to do. Okay, so that's it. Final recap, why clean data? This is just a repeating slide from earlier. One, it just facilitates the initial exploration and analysis. It's a necessity, a prerequisite, you have to do it. Um, it improves ability to collaborate with others. If you're transferring data to the statistician, there's less time, hopefully, cleaning the data than uh, more time spent doing the statistical analysis, and three, it helps to achieve reproducible research if you're really diligent in how you clean your data, and really tracking how you got from raw data to the final results. Um, this is all the useful links, recommended resources, so if you really are interested in the how-to um, of cleaning data, there's some really good uh, courses on LinkedIn Learning, like for R, for Excel, I'm sure there's others, those are the two that I watch. Um, some other interesting um, links, perhaps, um, all there. And that's it. 12.35. <laughs> all right. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask me now or afterward. I'm open. So let's see you. Oh, do you guys need the microphone? I should, could you repeat your question? I don't know. There you go. Yeah, so my question was um, a Qualtrics question uh, where you have open text and there's a, a, a feature within um, a Qualtrics called Text IQ and it does some of that analysis for you uh, that looks at that reams of open text and sort of quantifies and says what were repeatable instances of of certain patterns of data and such. And so I was just wondering if we 
if anybody else has used it, and if we can use it, if we have it here. Cool. Okay, so we do have that feature. I've never used it, so I can't and really speak to Just much about it. what I read about it looks pretty cool. So okay, yeah. Another. Um, so the, the word from Qualtrics is that our instance of Qualtrics has it, but it's the basic version. Okay. I didn't know there were gradations. Okay. Okay. Good to know. I didn't realize that. I'll still look at it. Anybody else? There is, if you have access to a SQL program, um, and this most sim simple access is using Microsoft Access. Mm -hmm. You can use um, things like 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 McDonald's, and it will go through and flag all of your, anything that looks like McDonald's, and then you can specify the degree of fuzziness. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> but mm -hmm. you have to import it into Access and then figure out how to run it. Sure, yep, that's um, a good resource. And one other thing I on the code book, I, I always like people who come by with data to document their hypotheses mm -hmm. with variable names yeah. that are in the data set, so I know if they're talking about Variable X, they mean this, and variable Y, they mean this, and such and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just one other thing that I, I bump into a lot, where people in one column will combine string and numeric data, text oh. and numeric data. Oh, yeah, that's not it's good either. Three, yeah. <laughs> or multiple variables in one cell. Yes, yeah. yeah. That, that always creates that. You always have to go through and try to split that up. So. <laughs> like yeah. diastolic, systolic. Yeah, yeah. Separate cell, separate yeah. columns. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> so I'm kind of new to doing things with qualitative data, and I have some teams that are actually going to translate, you know, some written, handwritten data mm -hmm. and put it into Excel. I am concerned about you know, them uniformly interpreting what something says and putting it in the right place. Yeah. Do you have any tips um, to recommend, like, how to get them trained in that? Or Yeah. Well, I was going to have a meeting and just uh, make sure we talk through each of the pieces through yeah. some examples, maybe. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having some consensus on, you know, you know, showing examples to the entire team and making sure everybody is interpreting them, them the same way. Uh, you know, having that written out, you really need to come to consensus. Sometimes if it's not easy to do that ahead of time, you might have um, you know, two separate teams tackle it and independently and then compare afterward. And then if there are differences, then you come to consensus on those. Um, and then you have to have, you know, you yourself will probably be the, the final say on what's going on there. Um, but that can be time consuming to have you know, two sets of teams do that rather than one. So it really depends on how well that interpretation is how if that's going to be very difficult or, or not um, anybody else have thoughts on comments on that question any experience <laughs> there's one of our students right there okay, <laughs> okay um, yeah hi <laughs> one of the other things that i had done before and i was thinking of doing again is you have the initial raw data but then as we clean it to create a new tab oh sorry. so that yes yeah. We're not changing Thank something you. in the raw entries. Yes. Yeah. I, I should have emphasized that, but yes, whenever I get data, I don't touch it. I don't manually go into Excel and change something. It's always, I import it into R and I do everything in R. There's that way I can't, you know, I accidentally mess something up, you know, so that, that data is final. I'm not touching that raw data. So any, any changes I make, I have that documented script on where that was changed, how it was changed. So. If I have any questions, then it's, it's written record right there. So that's, I think, okay. a very important point. Always have that raw data untouched. Create a copy of the data. Maybe just another idea to help whenever you're working as a team but working separately. What we've found is that, yes, sitting down and talking together about the definitions, uh, but having that template of your variables set up and everyone just sort of working in the same template and mm -hmm. there's still room for human error but at least we all had the same template at one point right um, and then yes always like the raw data um, whenever we're just really desperate to make sure we're <laughs> looking the same 
we've we use the Google Drive a lot, and it's not our favorite at all, but we can all see each other working. Yeah. So there's, yeah. you know, that pro, or you can even have separate tabs, but you're still all seeing each other in there. Yeah, um, yeah. And mm -hmm. then you still have to figure out how to get it out and make it look more yeah. professional. Yeah, and Google Sheets, I've used that a lot with students um, and, and other researchers, not just students, but um, uh, Google Sheets, you can, there's options in there to have validated choices. So if it is a kind of preform text, you have just like in Qualtrics and RedCap and other programs, you can make a list ahead of time of what choices are going to be valid values. Um, so you can define that ahead of time in Google Sheets as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you have any questions about Google Sheets, just Google it. <laughs> You'll probably find the answer. <laughs> but yeah, Google Sheets is great because you have that shared, um, everyone can look at it at the same time, pretty handy. But then everybody can edit at the same time. So you got to be careful with that aspect as well. So, but there is version control on Google Sheets too, so that saves you there. Um, yeah, good comments. Yeah, do you have any? Uh, I lock my Google Sheet, the one that oh, I work on. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's good. You can lock it. <laughs> okay, yeah, good, good tip. There seems to be new features coming out with Google Sheets all the time, so helpful ones anyway. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions? All from the Mesa side, none from Kirksville. Hi, <laughs> Kirksville. Oh, is there? Oh, she waved. <laughs> Hi, Jane. <laughs> it was Jane's story that I told about the nursing study, so she can take credit for that. <laughs> All right. Well, there aren't any other questions. I mean, of course, you know, if you do have any other questions, see me afterward. I'm happy to discuss anything. So. Yeah, they were, but those are just chat, but not questions from earlier. So. Okay. Well, I well, have good a question. to see you all. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening.